Welcome to episode one of This, That, and All Things Cinema podcast. I am your host, Ryan David Rogers. So as this podcast is just starting out, I am going to be kind of going through the process of trying out some different formats and seeing how it works. If at all you like how this particular format is, I'm going to be doing a couple of news stories before talking about uh, an indie film. If you like that format, please either comment if you're watching or listening to this on YouTube or send an email at thorndykeproductions at gmail.com. So I figured first off we could be doing a little bit of movie news because something interesting actually caught my attention while I was on a screen rant. And that is apparently Sylvester Stallone wants there to be a prequel to Rambo. That's right. Right. As we're getting re- ready for Rambo Last Blood, the was supposed to be the final installment of the Rambo film series. Turns out there's a good chance we might get to see what John Rambo was like before he went to Vietnam. Those who are unfamiliar with the Rambo film series, the first film in the franchise called First Blood, follows a Vietnam veteran named John Rambo who ends up go, going again, up against an entire group of, uh, mil, of, um, <laughs> of police in the small town because well, see, he asked the cop where he could get a bite to eat. They end up arresting him for that. Rambo ends up having a PTSD flashback, breaks out of jail, and then everything goes to shit. There's all kinds of destruction. And surprisingly, the only person that dies in that entire film was a guy who, who thought riding in a helicopter without his seatbelt was a good idea. Sylvester so Stallone actually did speak with Screen Rant about the idea of there being a prequel to First Blood. And let me read the quote real quick. I always thought Rambo when he was like, when he was 16 or 17, I hope they can do the prequel. He was the best person you could find. He was the captain of the team. He was the most popular kid in school, super athlete. He was like Jim Trope and the war is what changed him. If you saw him before, he was like the perfect guy. That is definitely interesting, and it's always a good idea to have an idea of where the character was before things actually start out. Even if it's something that you don't see or really discover when it comes to character, just having that little bit of additional detail, even if it ends up being something super minor or could possibly be irrelevant, it could add that much more depth to the character, and maybe it's just because I haven't watched First Blood in a long time, but the whole idea of, like, of who was John Rambo before going to Vietnam, it could work, but at the same time, it, it always will bring up the question for a prequel. Is it really necessary? Because, I mean, the last prequel film I saw that I felt like is wanted was the new Planet of the Apes trilogy. Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, War for the Planet of the Apes. Because you kind of get to saw a bit of the world that was before the events of Planet of the Apes and just how much of there being a time gap between that Planet of the Apes trilogy and the original Planet of the Apes. You definitely get a good idea of, like, if the Planet of the Apes trilogy, you know, Rise, Dawn, War, were the kind of the events of what really happened and then what you kind of ultimately end up learning about through the original five Planet of the Apes is kind of like this, kind of like the history of it, it definitely does work. But in the case of a Rambo prequel, first off, I'm wondering what they would even call it. Would they call it like, I don't know, Rambo Zero? <laughs> kind of like how I named the first installment of my podcast, Episode Zero. <laughs> but, um, and I'm not too sure how well it could work because it's like, 
ultimately, it could be one of those things where it's like, it does give Ramble this kind of depth that you would never really expect or you would even hear him talk about. And then again, maybe I'm just talking uh, out of my ass because I've only seen First Blood. And I haven't seen First Blood Part 2, haven't seen Rambo 3, haven't seen uh, Rambo 4, or... And of course, Last Blood isn't out yet, so... Haven't got a chance to watch that. But anyway, it'll... So, the anyway, the idea of a Rambo prequel... I'm, I'm just not too sure about it. But how about we talk about something I am super sure about? And that is anamorphic lenses. For those who aren't aware, anamorphic lenses are basically this specially designed lenses that let you be able to stretch the Im image in camera. And when you de-squeeze it in post, you end up getting things like oval bokeh, uh, lens flare, all kinds of like these cool quirks to it that really can actually add something to the overall image. It is definitely a unique look, although it is pretty expensive to actually be able to do proper. And it can be a bit difficult to do it on the cheap because the cheapest way you can go about it is getting a projection lens, sticking it in front of your camera with a telephoto lens as a taking lens per se. Then either doing dual focus or getting a, a, a single focus uh, solution, which ends up being more glass. You put it in front of that, and that ultimately put, takes a major effect on the overall image itself. Which can be a lot, I know. Well, as of in recent years, there have been some companies that have been making anamorphics a bit affordable. The most well-known one, of course, being SLR Magic, who have done both anamorphic adapters, where you would put in front of a camera lens, and then their own proprietary anamorphic, which is a bit affordable, semi-affordable if you decide to rent them. But I end up having a couple of problems. Well, I haven't used the SLR Magic's anamorphics, but just there's a couple of things that kind of bother me about what the kind of selection for, per lens mount. Like the 2X is only available for micro four thirds and the only micro four thirds camera that can take advantage of the 2X would be the Panasonic GH5, GH4, GH5S. Or else they only have a 133 stretch available for PL mount, so you'd have to get an adapter if you want to use it on really any other camera that was not PF, uh, PL native mount. Well, um, it seems like Chinese camera accessory manufacturer Siri, S I R U I, um, kind of decided to be the one to answer the call because they actually made, they're actually in the process of making an anamorphic lens, which is a 133 stretch, has a aperture of 1.8 and is a 50 millimeter. So, so what, what that means is it's, well, the focal length is going to be 50 millimeter. It widens the field of view by about 33%. So the actual field of view will be like 37, 38 millimeters. You put that on a 16.9 sensor and it's going to be in an aspect ratio of 2.4 over one. And of course it's going to have the bokeh, the oval bokeh. It's going to have the flares. Um, the article I'm looking at on Cinema 5D, the um, the video host a actually shot the interview on the uh, anamorphic itself. And I gotta say, it definitely does look pretty good. Like sharp, but not like super modern DSLR lens sharp. The bokeh definitely has an interesting characteristic. Fl flares are definitely not like super traditionally straight, like if like you would originally use to like line it up or whatnot, but that it's definitely one of those looks that's like, that is, can be considered signature. 
And according to the article, it's going to be available on three different mounts, a Sony FE mount, a Fujifilm X mount, and Micro Four Thirds. So as much as I'd love to be able to use something like this on, like say my Canon T3i, unfortunately it's not going to be a possibility, which saddens me a little bit. And as I look to upgrade cameras, it does make me a bit contemplational about possibly going with one of those as a native mount instead of sticking with Canon EF because while well, Canon has been doing some stuff with their cameras, it kind of makes me go, yeah, no, please stop taking away 24 frames a second in the consumer cameras. But that's a different rant for another time. And let's just hope Canon like learns that maybe they should not take away 24 frames. What definitely has me most excited about this anamorphic is what the price is going to be. Uh, it's going to be around seven to eight hundred dollars estimately. And I feel like that's definitely a good price for a prime anamorphic. I can definitely see people kind of doing spending that much or even over a thousand for like a DIY anamorphic setup, like I mentioned earlier. And so kind of having the price be around what people either would kind of do for like a DIY setup definitely have unique characteristics like some of the stuff that was in the in that interview photo that video it would I can definitely see a lot of people kind of flocking to this for some for just like okay we don't have to deal with lens alignment we don't have to deal with uh dual uh focusing or having a single focus solution. I personally would also want to buy this if I had the appropriate mount for it, which unfortunately at the moment I don't. It's going to be coming out also early uh, 2020, which means, hey, I'll definitely have plenty of time if I really want to, to actually get a camera that has the appropriate mount and be able to get the lens if I really want to. I kind of hope that some companies like rental houses see this and they're like you know what would be a good idea if we got a bunch of these and have them available to rent for like i could see this going for like maybe around a hundred bucks for a weekend and you definitely have that option i get the feeling a lot of people would definitely want would want to rent it and they might make their money back I mean, I know if Lens Pro to Go actually had this lens available for rental, I for one of my for a personal film shoot of mine, I'd probably be like, okay, I am so renting this for a weekend. But um, that's just kind of how I feel about it. If you want to tell me how you feel about it and you're watching this on YouTube, leave a comment. Uh, lastly, I want to kind of talk a little bit about mental health. Now, this is still a filmmaking podcast, film and filmmaking podcast. Don't worry, I'm going to be talking about a film that tackles mental health. Why mental health of all things, especially for the, what, uh, the first, well, technically second, but I'm calling it episode one for a podcast. It's a difficult subject to really tackle and it's a subject that's hard to talk about, about and in a way actually do it right. I kind of wanted to talk about this um, film that I I saw a while back, and I kind of rewatched a bit of it today, called Unsound. For those who are unfamiliar with it, I quickly want to talk about a uh, director by the name of Darius Britt. I discovered his channel D for Darius years ago, back when I had an an old channel YouTube channel that no longer existed its existence and the end up remembering seeing his uh, proof of concept short film seafood tester and i gotta say that was a pretty solid film and he, here's the thing about seafood tester it's actually it's a after seeing unsound it ended up being like seafood tester is like the last bit of unsound Thinking of really thinking about it, 
and maybe it's just because you have that additional character development of Unsound in comparison to Seafood Testa, but Seafood Testa definitely works better as kind of like the epilogue, in a, a film's epilogue, than just being a standalone short film. Now, I'm just going kind of rambling on he, here, and you might be wondering, okay, what is Unsound even about? And here's, if you, you were to look up the film on YouTube, which the director himself, Darius Britt, did upload to his official YouTube channel, so you can be able to watch for free. The film is about, as it says in the description, and I feel like this is pretty accurate. An aspiring filmmaker attempts to jumpstart his career by creating a documentary about classic Volkswagen Beetles when his mother, whom he cares for at home, suffers another schizophrenic episode. She places everything he's worked for in jeopardy. That is pretty accurate, and I gotta say, unsound is quite the intense film. I mean, after just the opening little introduction from the director himself before just letting the film play, the opening shots of it is just really gripped me. There was a lot of impressive cinematography in this film. So much so, it really helps, like, you have some good performances. You have amazing cinematography. You have professional great quality lighting. Like, I know Darius Britt between actually shooting the film and actually releasing it like seven odd years later, actually done additional short films since then. I, I think I have just haven't seen his most recent one, Not Cool. If you were to say to me, Unsound was done by what is considered a first-time director, which is usually a term associated for someone who hasn't done a feature film yet. I would be like, yes, you're kidding, right? Because everything about it screams like it was done by someone who, like, how do I put this? A lot of the times, unless they work in the Hollywood system, first-time, like, no-budget directors... They end up making films that could be like, I'm not sure how to describe it, but basically I feel as though, though Darius Britt's first feature film, Unsound, is definitely a cut above kind of what you would expect when you hear no budget indie. <laughs> That's really the best way I can describe it, to be honest with you. You have a director dealing with a difficult subject matter as mental health, you have him actually acting in it. You have it being shot on a DSLR, which now you can get off of eBay for $200. And you have it look amazing. You really need to know what you're doing and be working with people that know what they're doing in order to really pull it off. And I really do feel like unsound you really need to see this for yourself. I'm going to, if, if you're watching or listening to this on YouTube, I am going to have a link to it in the description. Like, this film is, like, <laughs> way too good just to be on YouTube. I kind of wish, in a way, Darius actually went the self, went, learned, start to learn a bit about distribution, even if it was just, like, putting up on Amazon. Because at this point, any filmmaker can actually get their film off of Amazon. No guarantee they'll stay on there, but they can at least put it up there for a bit. Although, I gotta say, when it comes to Unsound, because of the subject matter, it might be a bit um, difficult for some people to get through. Um, having, I mean, I have mental health problems in my family. So being able to lay some, to some of the stuff, even though it's not on as as much of a scale as what trans um, transpires in the film itself, it was really just. I felt like I had to stop stop for a bit, a bit just to collect myself, and then I immediately pulled me back in due to how gripping everything about it was. So yeah, I would definitely suggest watching Unsound 
and then maybe following it up with his making of documentary, which is simply called How I Made My First Movie Making Unsound. I'll include links to both of those in the description, again, if you're watching or listening to this on YouTube. And I think that's all I kind of have to say about that stuff for this episode. Um, and if you did uh, find this episode interesting and you want to hear more, then be sure to either subscribe to the Thorndike Productions YouTube channel or follow me on Facebook at Thorndike Productions. And I guess that's all for now. Um, I'm out. Peace. Peace.